Divine Truth Training Material Training material generated by Jesus, Mary and others for assorted topics and projects. In the first part of the Introduction to Environmental Recovery Training, Jesus gives an impromptu introduction to the subject of environmental recovery to invited guests and discusses the necessity for action, multi-generational destruction of the environment, the recovery cycle, sustainable recovery, and introduces the ideas of learning from God and utilizing plants, organisms, and ways to support full environmental recovery. The training was recorded on the 4th of January 2017 from 1 p.m. in Wilkesdale, Queensland, Australia. Ready to go? G'day. So I suppose you could call this, and, it, and it's uh, mostly for our visitors, but um, I suppose you could call this a basic introduction to environmental recovery. So maybe I'll write that on the board. What's that called? So what's that called? What's that called? From the previous talk? That's called my theme, my theme, my theme, okay. <laughs> what are going to be my main points? Erosion. Erosion might, you reckon that might be a main point? Well, if it's a recovery, you probably want to include the fact that we got destroyed it in the first place, right? So environmental destruction. It's probably going to be one of my first main points, isn't it? So I'm helping the people in the previous talk that we gave this morning about how to create a talk, right? So environmental destruction. So we want to find all the ways that the environment is primarily destroyed. Then, then what are what we're going to do? What how how do we go about recovery? So you could call it environmental recovery. Will be the next thing that we talk about, maybe. And in that, we'll have a number of different subpoints, perhaps, won't we? What do you reckon? I suppose it's you're guessing as to what they might be, but you can see that I've got going to have a theme, and there's two of my main points, my my two only main points actually for my whole discussion. Hmm. Okay, why are we interested in it? There's my intro. What? Why are we interested in? Basic intro to environmental recovery. Well, uh, as we've discussed, remember, remember a few of you were present when we were outside at the lunch table discussing the destruction of the environment and the long-term effects it's having on the human race. And, and the reality is that uh, the destruction of the environment's been going on, obviously, for tens of thousands of years by humanity. And a lot of times what, when we look at an environment, like we look at the environment here, for example, because it's been like this for many, many years, usually our entire lifetime, we don't, we don't see what we do over that period of time. And, and unfortunately, what's happened historically is tens of thousands of years ago, for example, in places like Turkey and Egypt and the Middle East that are now completely barren and mostly desert, were all treed. They all had forests on them, right? But what happens is that the trees get uh, destroyed over many years, some many times over generations. One generation destroys one group, another generation destroys the next group. And then they introduce farming techniques like you know, goats in particular in the Middle East, but cattle, meat-eating type of farming techniques. And what those meat-eating farming techniques do is they every little seed that is already in the ground that could come up to recover the land is eaten down by the farm animals. So, so in, the, in the soil, we start off with huge, literally millions and millions of seeds in any square, um, squ square metre of land. Usually there's more than a million seeds in that area of, of land. And, and, but what happens is 
over time those seeds come up and because of our grazing techniques and our farming techniques we mow them down or we destroy them before they can reseed so now the seed bank in the soil gets less and less and less over thousands of years you can see what happens is that what might start off with millions of seeds per square meter in the soil ends up with being only a few hundred or even tens of seeds in the square meter and then the next generation some of those grow again and then they get eaten down and then by the time you have this growing cycle that never gets to fruition where they seed where they fruit and seed what happens in the end is there's no more seeds left in the soil of that particular type to recover the land anymore right so so the cycle basically is the seeds the recovery plants which there are millions of seeds of in the ground germinate so they germinate they grow into seedlings our farming techniques destroys destroy them right and then of course the recovery plants that are in the bank try to start again but now there's less of them there's less seeds so you end up with a cycle that is slowly converging converging into nothing left now if after a few generations of time there are no plants that can actually grow or they're all getting eaten down then what starts to happen is that uh, well there's a number of different things that start to happen the first thing that happens is that because there are no plants now we get bad erosion st dust storms and other things like that which cover over the water table the water table all the water table in that area gets evaporated into the into the atmosphere dumped usually somewhere else and so now now all of the groundwater that were there that would support the plants has now disappeared as well or gone very low you know that's why they have to big deep 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 wells to get to the water in those locations and eventually over thousands of years what happens is you end up with a desert wasteland in some places a rocky desert wasteland in other places a sandy desert wasteland where very few plants can grow and there's very very few natural seeds left in the ground to recover the land does that make sense and and because it happens over generations each generation doesn't see it happening they just think that what they've got now is normal All right so they don't actually see it occurring it's only when you're a spirit for many thousands of years that you can observe it over thousands of years and see it occurring generation after generation that you start to see what's really going on so we have this uh, recovery plants which would normally turn into seedlings and therefore start recovering the land getting destroyed again through the farming techniques and then of course there's less recovery plants that can become seedlings because there's less seed in the ground and then of course that continues this cycle continues until you basically have no longer the soil based structure or the water structure anymore left in the soil to support growth of any plant so even though there are still many many thousands of seeds that are not recovery plants in that ground none of them can grow or many of them have been blown away by this stage so we have this long-term environmental destruction which which continues to this day and in fact it's worsening it's worsening every generation we we introduce new sorts of farming techniques which include machinery and the machinery therefore destroys more land we can clear more land more rapidly before we had to do it hand by hand generally now we do it with machinery that's capable of of clearing football fields of of growth every single second on the planet so we have a football field i think it's every second getting destroyed on the planet and um, and then of course we continue doing this to it we grow plants we grow plants but eventually the soil can't even grow that plant anymore 
and so we get this destruction and and a lot of these things in the last hundred years have have rapidly increased in in their in, in their occurrence for instance in south australia uh, many of you will know the area between um, Sejuna and Western Australia, that area there. That, uh, that was a Mallee scrub area um, only 50 years ago. It was a Mallee scrub area. The scrub was about 30 or 40 uh, feet, th about 30 feet high in its canopy, very, very low, low scrub canopy but it was full of wildlife as you can imagine and it had a quite a good rainfall it had good enough rainfall to grow what they call hard wheat there so what they did was they got bulldozers and they strang chains between the bulldozers and bulldozed whole areas that thousands of acres it was very flat because it used to be an inland sea it's the mallee recovered that from an inland sea and um and and they, it recovered over, over literally tens of thousands of years it took for recovery because well, the middle of Australia was an inland sea. And so what, what happened was that the recovery occurred over thousands and thousands of years, but, but these bulldozers went through the place in a few years. And they produced, in the end, land, uh, which was tens of thousands of hectares of land, um, able, very, very flat land, and able to be farmed for hard hardened wheat which is the best kind of wheat that you can buy on the world market and, and so what they did that they did that and uh, and within 15 years most of the land become unviable so they had crops for 15 years but within 15 years most of the land become unviable un and within 25 years no land there is able to be farmed anymore None at all. So, you know, that gives you an illustration of what happens when we do this process in, on a large scale. In Queensland here, it's happening all the time, uh, poisoning as well as the farming. And, and, and pretty much in every country of the world, it's the same. If you fly over Brazil, it's really interesting when we flew over Brazil, because when you fly over the Amazon, you see this nice green rainforest sort of thing. And then as you go further, all of a sudden it turns into the kind of country we have here. All of a sudden, it's like you're flying over rainforest, then all of a sudden it becomes this, right? And you can see what's happened. There was a rainforest there, but they cleared that land for cattle, car for cattle farming many years ago now. And now it won't recover because it's continually being farmed and uh, and it's becoming the interior of Brazil is becoming drier and drier as a result of that as well same process it's just the same process this continual environmental destruction driven primarily by the emotion of wanting to eat meat but also by other emotions too of making making money out of farming uh, making money out of feeding the world uh, rather than just giving away food and and unfortunately meat-based farming is obviously very very high in terms of its, un its lack of productivity so that's what's going on uh, and we do it everywhere and there's places in the world where it's happening all the time still and there's places like in Russia uh, in the Ukraine and other places in, around the Black Sea, where now what used to be beautiful, fertile valleys have now turned into desert wastelands. Lakes that were up to 300 metres deep have completely dried up completely um, because the water table gets evaporated. <coughs> now that that happens, and so you have you end up with you end up with large areas of land no longer viable to produce food or anything else for hundreds of years in the future and considering the fact that uh, we're still doing the same thing probably tens of thousands of years in the future yeah uh, Catherine you want to ask if we use the mics because then you can get we'll get a recording of this for you guys and yeah, I just wanted to say I don't know whether you kn you know or not but the fellow who has the f fish ponds or whatever they were there he's gone through and poisoned all the trees mm -hmm. where where is this on the learning centre. Oh, yeah, that wouldn't. I surprise. mean, it's not on the learning centre; it's yeah. the place. Yeah, but that's it's a normal thing around here. It's like, yeah. So what we want to do is learn how to recover it, really, don't we? Like how to stop, stop, start the recovery process. 
Now you can see you can see that in the soil the recovery plants are the ones that are struggling because they are the ones that have come up and been eaten down, come up, been eaten down, come up and been eaten down. And by recovery plants we mean plants that prepare the soil for other plants. And normally you need a, a factor of 10 to 1 of recovery plants and other plants in any in any environment. So you need plants that can recover the soil and build the soil uh, and in a, in a range of 10 to 1 of the parts that, that use the nutrients in the soil in order to produce food or produ have some other value. And so there, once the recovery plants are eaten in this process of destruction, you end up with no seed of recovery plants in the soil anymore. But you end up with still a lot of other seed, particularly where there's been no environmental erosion or there's been a clay base, uh, not so much sandy soils because they've get blown away, but, but with anything to do with the clay base or, or something like that, generally you end up with still a lot of seed in the soil. But unfortunately, um, the recovery plants needed to recover that soil enough for those particular uh, seeds to grow are no longer there and so those seeds can't grow any either. Now seeds can last tens of thousands of years in fact uh, I think the longest recorded corn or maize seed uh, that grew was a seed that they unearthed when they first uh, opened the um, I think it was the uh, Great Pyramid they opened it they found some maize seeds in there and they actually grew them and that was three and a half. They dated, they they dated the uh, the pyramids to about three thousand years ago. But the reality is, the pyramids were built uh, like tens of thousands of years ago, not three thousand years ago. But even with their dating, they you know still like three thousand years for for that seed, and it still grew. So so there's still the life principle present in these seeds, sitting in the ground, uh, in a dormant state, waiting to grow. Yeah, which is interesting, eh? Yeah. Dave? The 10 to 1 ratio is for 10 recovery plants to one regular? Yeah, 10 recovery plants to one food producing plant, if we could call it that, or one value, one what we have. See, normally we only value the food producing plants, but the reality is the recovery plants provide the nutrients and the soil. They are the things that get the nitrogen into the soil, but also other nutrients. And the recovery plants uh, range from weeds, prickly weeds, um, through to uh, nitrogen producing plants which all have pods usually or pea pods in them and and there's a large variety of those kind of plants right from right from grasses right the way through to very very large trees and and they you could call them the pea based plants but what they really are are nitrogen fixing plants so and is that throughout the whole recovery process or is that 10 to 1 only when it's really bad no 10 to 1 is a normal like would be for normal functionality um, you need you need the recovery plants obviously once you've got a pristine environment the recovery plants don't need to exist but usually in the soil there's li literally millions of seeds of of those recovery plants waiting for the job of recovering the environment if if there is a need to recover the environment the problem is that uh, farming techniques have gotten rid of all of the recovery and uh, like the process of recovery. Does it make sense? So you know, the eating of meat, the farming of uh, sheep and cattle, goats, um, any any f food production involving meat in particular, but also large scale farming where they eradicate most of the. Uh, you know, the variation in the plants, like, and then put in a wheat crop, and then they try to poison weeds and poison weeds and poison weeds. In other words, they recall they're poisoning the recovery plants. Right? The normal farming technique is to poison the recovery plants, or somehow remove the recovery plants, and get enough of another crop, the one that you know is called have crop of value, a value crop, and. And unfortunately, what happens eventually is the value crop won't grow anymore because it needs the recovery plants really to provide the nutrients to the soil in order for them to grow. So what we end up doing then is pumping. We, we then go mining and we go dig a hole, hole somewhere else uh, and we start ripping out of the soil all of the all of the nutrients that we need to. And then we spray or we or we deliver that those nutrients through chemical or or through fertilization methods 
onto the land in order to get the land able to be viable again to give us a food bearing plant. But obviously sooner or later what, what they're finding now is that the more they've done that the less the more they pump into the land the less it's producing and eventually it gets to a stage where it can't produce anything at all and only weeds could grow but the, all the weed seeds have all been usually if they've been let grow and then they're fine but unfortunately a lot of them have been destroyed through cattle farming and sheep farming and other techniques that have allowed, eaten all of those seeds out of the system as well so then you end up with large-scale environments like the Middle East where hardly anything will grow yeah. and if you look through um, all of Europe even a very green uh, very uh, viable climate for growth in a lot of ways but uh, very little variety because a lot of the recovery plants are gone and the farming techniques have removed them and it's fortunate that just they have enough rainfall to maintain or enough water to maintain some of their growth but aside from that um, if you took the water away from any event and sooner or later the whole place would just die a natural death you know mm -hmm. Courtney so did God not then create deserts as part of the natural design of the earth really there's Desert no uh, by nat by nature there are deserts uh, that occur due to the cycling that occurs of the plates you know so what god created uh the system uh, the way the earth works as you know is that you know you've got subduction zones of plates and and rising zones of plates so so a plate subducts under another plate and uh, basically it's a recycling and then there's other places in the earth where uh, you've got uh, produce, producing um, new soil, if you like, new new nutrients coming from deep within the earth, pushed up, and and you also have the volcanic activity, you know, where you have a volcano uh, doing doing all of its jobs. Now, these recovery plants were intended to recover those barren landscapes into a forest, so so they're always been present. That that's what their intention is to recover that. But their intention wasn't to do, try to do large-scale recovery of huge amounts of land that humankind have destroyed um, and continue to destroy every century, you know, and to a worse degree every century. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Any other questions? No? So, so, so we've got this environmental process that, that is insidious, and it's insidious because nobody in any single generation observes it really occurring and it's only in this generation actually that if you examine areas now and 50 years ago that you can start to see things occurring over a 50 year period but in any previous examination generally it occurred over much longer periods than 50 years and unfortunately for many of the last 2000 years or even more the average human lifespan was less than 50 years or around 50 years so at the end of the day, the average generation didn't notice the real change. And so nobody says, ah, oh, nobody flags the change and says, ah, oh, we've got to do something about it, right? Tris? Is this also because uh, they didn't have very, um, didn't record the history of the environment very well as well? They didn't document very much stuff? Yeah, humankind by nature is only interested in sort of raping the environment for its own survival. And as a result, they, they don't record what's in the environment. There's very few scientists in the past who have recorded what's in the environment. There's, there's, in, there's scientists now, obviously, who are doing it, but they're only looking at the last generation, of course. You know, there's very few records that exist about previous generations of what was there. It was interesting when we first talked to Pete and Eloisa about this subject down at Kyabra, and I was talking about what Kyabra looked like before humankind got there, and, and, you know, I, and it was only like 350 years ago or so um, when it, that it looked like these beautiful forests, colourful trees, large-scale areas of food available to all animals, and, and, and you know, unless... And if, if you talk to a spirit who lived there then, then you've got an opportunity to see it, but, but you know... In a normal generation on Earth, you just don't see the changes that have happened. You just don't. Of course, one generation destroys it all, but most of the generations of the past two have no understanding of how to recover it. 
So therefore they don't understand the significance of the destruction. They don't understand the problems associated with recovery. Mm. Big problems, eh? And in the end, uh, it could conceivably get to the stage where human life is so unviable that, uh, that we're all competing for water and, and food-based resources. That's how bad it could become. <coughs> and the water issue governments have known about for many many years um, but the environmental issues most governments are completely in ignorance of right at this moment um, yeah so the 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 question then becomes how do we recover such things well, obviously, you can see, if we look at the recovery process, we can see that these things, weeds, are going to be a key part of the recovery. Right? Aren't they? They grow prolifically. They usually have some kind of prickles. They usually are inedible for many, for many of the weeds, inedible. And the beauty of all of that is that now they can put matter and, and nutrients back into the soil without getting eaten and without someone coming along and pulling it out or you know so that that's why they're like that so that so that so that nothing will eat them while they're doing the job they've been created to do so they become an essential part of the recovery process but how do we get them to grow if there's no water <laughs> because we've removed water from the water table and, and all we've got is just soil and nothing else. So how do we get them to grow? Well, obviously, we've got to start before the weeds. We've got, to, we've got to get enough happening so the weeds can grow. We want the weeds to be prolific. Um, but the only way we can do that is by creating an environment where they can grow. Now, fortunately, they grow in very harsh environments, which is one of the way reasons why God created that way. They grow in harsh environments. So, so fortunately, there's not too much you have to do in order for them to grow. Right? But if you're looking at other plants, food-based plants or that have value, so-called value to us, they require a lot more energy and a lot more nutrients in the soil to grow than a weed does. And in fact, a weed is all about putting nutrients in it and stuff back into the soil. Right? Now, if the weeds don't put, get enu enough take on the soil, then you, you, you get to the next stage where the nitrogen-fixing plants, the plants that actually uh, produce um, what you'd call nutrients, uh, recover, recovery nutrients in the soil, enough for plants of value to grow, the nitrogen-bearing plants can't grow unless first you let the weeds grow and you let them recover, do the job of recovery, and uh, get to the point where you know they've recovered the plants enough the, the environment enough for the nitrogen bearing plants to grow now fortunately down at the center that's already happened the nitrogen bearing plants are growing you know you've got all these wattles and all these small saplings all growing everywhere that's indication that the nitrogen bearing process has started which means it doesn't need the weed process except in some areas there's still Weeds in the centre. Pete? Um, one of the cool things I've seen with the weeds is a lot of them are tap-rooted. And so you get this yep. aeration and with that polyethic thing, they literally take everything over to get the ground cover. Yes. Because obviously where we've got the dry bit, there's just no ground cover. That's right. So everything, it's evaporated. A lot of them are very sprawling plants and they a lot of them send out uh, runners as well and and can run out and a lot of them uh, can handle high temperatures far higher temperatures than an average plant for much longer periods of time uh, most of them have a large number of seeds that they produce at any one time so as soon as they get the opportunity to flower they produce huge amounts of seeds and and then on top of that they also most of the seeds are microscopic so so there's very little you can do to get get rid of them to get to get them going to get them out of the out of the you know out of the system so 
Um, I'm just not standing in the right place. One of the coolest things I saw at Kyabra was when we locked up a paddock and the entire paddock went with this flea bone thing. Yeah. It literally took up every little metre of this paddock. And, it was and, uh, and so they were like this high. Insanely high. Insanely high. <laughs> and, and when you walked over the paddock, the seed was this thick, thick on the ground. This massive mulch. Afterwards. Yeah. Yeah. And so the seed itself turned into a mulch for the soil. But and if you do two or three at least generations of that, then you find slowly the weed based plant slowly disappears. So it goes. It's got enough seed on the ground now, it's done enough to the ground to recover the nutrient that it was trying to recover, and now it's it's good enough, the ground's good enough for another plant, another recovery plant, um, hopefully a more uh like a more nitrogen bearing plant at some point to grow if that's allowed but of course when you farm it or you sheep farm it or cattle farm it as soon as they come up because the nitrogen bearing plants are all edible they get all mowed down again <laughs> so a lot of the weeds are not edible the most plant most some of the weeds are but a lot of the weeds aren't uh, they're not edible so they won't uh, provide food source or food value to animals but once the fixing plants come start coming up, most of them are edible. So now, you know, most farmers let let their cattle back in now, polish that all off, because it, it's a uh, you know means they don't have to feed their animals. And the trouble with that, of course, is it now has destroyed the cycle and caused the weeds to have to generate more now. Again, yeah, interesting, huh? You know. It's so you've got this uh, destructive process that needs a recovery and we need to get the weeds growing but you know in really bad problems like when i first came here the, there was a clay soil it was bare uh, rocky or clay it was like next door in most cases rocky and clay um there was obviously seed in the ground but no um way to get it to grow because the water would just run off the top of the soil no water would sink into the soil um, there would be no water deposits anywhere on the land and so any rain that occurred would just run straight off and down the riverways and 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 we couldn't keep them here so couldn't keep any water here so even though we get an okay rainfall like around 20 on the average it was, it's not been like that the last few years but normally it's normally 25 to 30 uh, inches of rain a year um, most of it went down the river anyway <laughs> and not on the land and even after a really big solid rain you know the top if you look dig down into the soil with the clay it's only the top 10 millimeters generally that's wet and the rest is all dry still so so unfortunately when we come here it's like there were no weeds growing <laughs> And there were very few recovery plants growing because they, they were still farming goats on the land. And so the goats would eat all the wattle. And so there was very few, very little wattle on the land as well when I first came to the property. And so the first question then became, well, you know, I know that in this clay there's a lot of seeds. I don't, I don't have to bring seed in at least. Whereas if you go to a, a desert based environment where there's been sandstorms and so forth, you'd even have to bring seeds into that environment because all the seeds would also be blown away. You follow? But here in this environment, because it's clay and, and also any rocky soil usually has some seeds in the soil still, which is fortunate I and mean, it hasn't blown away. So you, you know that all you've got to do is get enough recovery for those seeds to eventually germinate the problem is if the land has been farmed a long time those seeds are going to take a long time to generate because most of the nitrogen fixing seeds will have been eaten through previous generations of the cycle so fortunately here in australia we've only had a few generations of the cycle so we have a uh, an easy uh, time of it to recover really but if you go to places like the middle east because I've had literally millennia of the cycle, it's going to be very, very hard to recover that land um, without introducing seed, without introducing weeds, and without getting some kind of water into the system that re is retained on the land. Mm. So let's look at the re process of recovery. Obviously, the first thing you need is water to, to stay on the land. 
um, without water, um, obviously nothing will grow. Every, all life is dependent on it. So, so we need to somehow keep water on the land. Right. Now in the desert, you can see that's problematic. You might not receive rain for many years sometimes, uh, up to 10 years in some deserts. Um, you might not get any rain, but usually when you do get a rain, you get a huge rain, like huge rain, where it might rain for days and days and days. But unfortunately, all that rain just runs off, usually. It doesn't sink in anywhere. It doesn't go anywhere. There's no reservoirs or places to store that water. And unfortunately, it just runs down the waterways, usually out to sea. So places like, you know, the Sudan, that is often played by drought, um, most of their water runs out to sea. They have plenty of water. It's actually a semi-tropical environment. They have more rain than we have here in Australia, but most of the water just runs out to sea. So it's very, very hard to recover the land when all the top right, water and all the topsoil is running out to sea. So the first thing we need to do is keep the water on the land. Somehow, keep the water on the land. And we'll talk about different methods you can use to do that in different places, but that's number one. Isn't it? Keep water on the land. Once you've got water on the land, um, you need to now somehow encourage the weeds to grow, don't you? But, but the weeds can't grow without enough soil to grow in. <laughs> right? So the second thing we need to work on is the soil. We need to work on what's in the soil. Now, there's a number of things that we can do to improve the soil. Um, a lot of our waste... Uh, can be used to improve the soil, but also uh, we can have we can have things like worms and other microscopic uh, like creations of God that that are used to recover soil, and we can encourage their growth by providing things for them to grow, providing food for them. So we, to recover a soil, we need to do a number of things. Firstly, we need to get some intelligence into the soil. The problem with most soils that have had this process is that eventually there's no intelligence. And what I mean by that is quite simple. If you think here in Australia, the general way that we deal with our farming techniques is, firstly, we get rid of everything, we bulldoze it all down, right? But all the seed, so it's not a disaster because all the seed is still in the ground, right? So it's not a disaster just yet, right? It hasn't been done thousands for thousands of years, so it's not a disaster just yet. It's the last hundred or so that it's been done. It's not a disaster. We've still got seed in the ground at that stage. But then what we do is we put our farm animals on the, on the ground, and they will eat everything other than the weed-based seeds that are inedible. Right? And they'll do that for generations. So if you farm for 100 years, then there's generations of, of growth cycles. Every year, usually, there's a growth cycle where you get heavier rains, new surge germinate, germinate, and you get a growth cycle occurring. Those uh, animals are going to eat that growth cycle out. So over 100 years, you have 100 times where the newly germinating seeds that are all edible are all now destroyed. You follow? And, there's, and they're not being recovered because no, there's nothing dropping more seed into that location. So there's get the bank that's in the soil, the seed bank, you could call it, in the soil, is getting less and less. It's getting more depleted. It's less and less. So, so we end up with this uh, space where, where we've gotten rid of a lot of the seed. Now, the seed itself is intelligent. It's living. Any living creature, whether it's a plant or an animal, has intelligence. So the seeds themselves have intelligence. They do a job. They've been created for specific jobs. The weeds, in particular, have been created to recover certain types of, to suck in from the environment certain types of elements that the soil needs for its recovery. So, so the weeds are allowed to grow, but, but none of the nitrogen-fixing plants are allowed to grow because they're all edible. They're all gone. And not only that, most of their seed is now gone. So they can't actually grow easily. And the longer we do that, if we do it over a 1,000 years, then there's been 1,000 cycles of that. If we do it over 2,000 years, 2,000 cycles. If we do that over 10,000 years, there's 10,000 cycles of that. There's 10,000 less plants, recovery plants, in that piece of land now than there used to be per square metre. 
10,000 times less. So, you know, these are, it's a huge amount of uh, destruction to that environment over time. So even if it's 100 years, it's, uh, it's enough. Now, it depends on how much they've eaten it down as to how much uh, erosion and other problems occur which actually destroy the soil. So if the topsoil goes, which often does go, whether it's a clay base or a sandy base, uh, usually the topsoil will go due to, for different reasons, you know. Sometimes it's water erosion and other times it's wind erosion, but it disappears. And along with that, a lot of the weed-based seeds disappear because they are usually in the top layer of soil. The reason why they are is because they are very light and they also have to be in the top layer to germinate. Does that make sense? Um, usually most of the, the weed-based seeds will just fall on the ground, bit of water, and they'll germinate. They don't even have to be in the ground to germinate. So a lot of them are blown away or being eroded away. So we have very little weed, except for the weeds that the plant animals have left alone. Not much else will end up growing. So like with Pete's example with fleabane, animals don't necessarily like fleabane very much. It makes them a bit sick in the stomach. Um, and there's a number of other things that's quite, it's, it's not fully poisonous, but, but it can harm them. Um, so they don't eat it, they, they'd rather eat something else, so they leave it alone, fortunately. So that's why that property on that particular piece of land, you know, you get fleabane coming up, which is great for its recovery. Now, each seed has intelligence, because it has life principle embedded in it, it also has a job. God created every seed for a job, so it has intelligence, it knows what to do and it will do it. Right? But there's also, so, so the intelligence informs the seeds that create intelligence. But there's also other creatures, right down from bacteria, right the way up to microscopic creatures and then things like worms and other things that all exist in the soils. So you could call them living creatures, shall we now, bundle all of them together. Living creatures and organisms. That, that also have intelligence, and every one of those have a job too, a specific job. It's like, it's like a fly, you know, that has a job to consume waste. An ant has a job to do certain things and so forth. Everything has a specific job. And all of those things need to, some, or the intelligence needs to get back into the soil. Now what happens here in Australia, we, we clear the land, all these weeds grow, so what we decide to do is burn them all off. So in the process of burning them all off, any intelligence that's at above the soil is automatically destroyed. And because here in Australia they burn off, particularly in Queensland here, they burn off every year, every year the intelligence is destroyed. So you get to a point wh where there's no intelligence above the soil. There's only intelligence in the soil. And that's assuming there's still soil left there and it's not rock anymore or sand or, or clay, which has now got intelligence still, but it's all locked up due to the way in which it's consi cons the consistency of it. So, so we've got to get water in this and we've got to do something to this soil to get the intelligence back into the soil. Now, with any creature that's intelligent, then ne it needs to have food of some kind. It's reliant on finding out what its food is and feeding it. <laughs> That's all you've got to do. Now, it also needs a home. Any creature needs a home. You've got to find out what it likes to where it likes to live and do that. <laughs> Create a home for it. It needs food and a home. Food and shelter. It also needs water. Every creature needs water. So we've got... Water, food, and a home. Three things that we need to create. So in the soil, to have these intelligent creatures grow or develop, we need to have three things for them. One of them is the water. The other two are food, whatever the food is that they eat, and a home, the shelter, whatever, it, wherever it is that they need to survive. We need to create it. If we don't, the soil can't recover. Right. 
Now, once we've got the soil recovering, now we can get the weeds, which are also incorporated through the what we would call the underlayer of all the other living organisms that have been destroyed. They will all start coming back in to the environment. They'll be somewhere else and they'll all start coming back in. When I say they're somewhere else, oftentimes they're actually locked up in the soil. Many insects, for example, can survive hundreds of years in the soil in a state of stasis, a state of suspended animation, and therefore, as soon as the right conditions come for them, they will come automatically. You just got to create the conditions. So it's not only the weeds that we're now interested in, and we're interested in the recovery organisms right which include bacteria and, and right the way through to small microscopic organisms right the way up to things like worms and stuff like that and and then not only that on the top layer this is above the soil now we also need some recovery organisms things like all the insects that we need to pollinate things because because you because you can't grow something without pollination right we need insects to pollinate things Th so these insects must also be developed you can't get rid of them you have to develop them right and the recovery organisms, organism which include what's going on under the soil, but also now what's going on above the soil, need to be produced. Otherwise, the next generation of plants, which are all flowering plants, right, to produce more seed, will never produce more seed because they've never been fertilised. They've never been, what do you call it, um, pollinated. And so they've never been fertilised or pollinated, and as a result, they can't grow. If, the, if a plant's fertilised and pollinated, pollinated by the environment, it can grow and reproduce. So this is what we need for it to reproduce. So now that we've got the recovery organisms and the weeds growing on the top layer of the soil, now the soil is protected. The soil now is not going to erode anymore. It's not going to be blown away. The seeds that drop there are most likely going to stop them from being blown away by being caught up in the weeds. So even if some blow away, there'll be some caught up in the base of the plant in the weeds that will just stay there and re-germinate for the next cycle. Does that make sense? So even a, a bad wind blow or a bad rainfall, uh, you know, where heavy rain uh, no normally would wash everything away, won't wash everything away anymore we've now got some ability to recover the, the land. You follow? Yep. Okay. Now that that is happening, there are seeds in the ground. So the, these recovery weeds and recovery organisms are now doing their work. They are the intelligent creatures we need to do the work on the ground. You doing it by hand is really pointless. Because you're never going to be able to recover the amount of ground that a billion insects or a billion worms are going to be able to recover. You, you follow me? You're never going to be able to do it. You're better off getting them to do it. Right? They, they have been created for those specific, specific purposes, so you're better off getting them to do it. <laughs> if you tried to do it, man, it, it can take hundreds of years even, but you're also taking from another environment to do it, unfortunately. So you might be improving your environment while you're doing it, but, but what's actually happening is another environment elsewhere is getting destroyed to give you the nutrients to do it in your environment. Doing it this way, no other environment elsewhere is getting destroyed. So it's actually the most loving way to recover an environment. Right? The only time to get things that are waste from other people is that if, if it is treated as their waste and all they're going to do is burn it or all they're going to do is throw it away or whatever, then get it. Put it in your environment. Right? But, but generally it's best to not do that unless they are throwing it away or unless they you know, will try to get rid of it, unless they're not going to use it. Right? Because we want to recover the environment like this as much as we can. We'll talk about practicalities of how to do it in a minute. Okay, so now that we've got the re weeds and the recovery organisms in the environment, what are we doing now? Now we have the opportunity to start getting some of these plants, 
the nitrogen fixing plants, the ones that are actually edible by, by other organisms back into the system. We're getting higher intelligence back into the system. Right? Once that starts happening, now the soil will be prepared even further by those plants and animals and creatures, plants and living creatures, living organisms, to get to the stage where a what we call a food value plant can grow now by itself, right, without any assistance from you. The seed will probably, depending on what kind of soil, the seed will probably be in the soil already. So you won't have to bring the seed in. Unless, of course, you've got an environment like the Middle East where it's had tens of thousands of years of damage, then you will have to bring the seeds in. Right. You might even have to originally bring the weeds in and then bring the other seeds into the environment. You might even have to bring some of the insects in and some of the bacteria in and some of the other things in, even, into that kind of environment because it's been destroyed over tens of thousands of years. Up. Um, many years ago, I worked on a project of um, greening the desert in Saudi Arabia. Yep. Um, and some nursery people in Darwin all got together. And what we did was grew thousands, millions of Australian natives yep. and um, sent them over yep. in plane loads yeah. without all the seats in the plane. Yeah. But we did the wrong thing in doing that. Yeah, because a, a lot we of we the recovering. water in the soil hasn't been recovered, and a lot of the, the lot of the recovery organisms aren't there, and so you can't. It's not sustainable. No. no. Right. So some so of those things might grow, but but they a lot grew, of them would but die. But if we took the water off them, they'd die. They'd die. Yeah, because it's not the system's not sustainable. You've got to get the system sustainable in the locale. That's what you've really got to do. You can bring things in, but you've got to be careful what you're bringing in and why and what the role of that particular thing is because you really want it to be self-sustaining in the end don't you you don't like this is a creative process and any creative process means that in the end you're not going to have to maintain it all right so every time we need to maintain something like water it we're, we're already out of harmony with the system we need to encourage the water to come there and store it when it's there does that make sense and the other systems will come along and follow. It'll be a slower process, but it will be sustainable. Yep. Right. So how would we grow food-based plants sustainably so they don't suck up all the nutrients out of the environment? Well, once you've got uh, this system back where the nitrogen-fixing plants and everything are all now growing naturally, now you can introduce food-bearing plants into the system and they will be sustained by the other plants and the other systems you've put in place. So they'll grow naturally. In fact, what will happen for many of them, you won't even have to plant them. They'll just come up naturally and grow naturally. Uh, you won't even have to plant them. But in, again, in places where the soil has been so destroyed, where it's all been blown away and all the seeds been blown away, then you're going to have to introduce them. You know, usually by seed would be the best way. So the, the, the interesting thing about planting a seed is it will only grow if the conditions are perfect for it to grow. The, the, the problem with planting a plant is that it's already growing and, it's n and, it, and you don't know the condition of the soil that it's growing in. You don't. You've got to make, get it growing by adding things to the soil, but you don't know the condition of the soil. You don't know if that soil is actually ready for that plant. Right. But it, w the beauty of putting a seed on the, on the ground is that you know if it grows, the soil must be ready. Do you see? It's a measuring instrument for whether the soil is ready or not. The seed is, whereas the plant it doesn't measure anything. You see what I'm saying? Can you see that principle? Yeah. You put a seed there, it measures whether it's ready before it grows. You put a plant there, you're already forcing a change to the environment that it might not be ready for. Naturally, that's going to require work. Watering, fertilisation and other things need to be done to sustain that plant that with the seed, if it naturally grows, you know that it's probably going to be OK. Given the fact that it's grown, it, it's, it grows in its most ideal circumstance. Does that make sense? Yeah. So what you do is you encourage the growth of things Whatever it is, and you measure. So when I first came here, weeds grew. 
So that tells me the condition of the soil, tells me where we're at. Tells me that I've got to do more work on the intelligence, do more work getting the water there, because the recovery plants weren't growing, it was only the weeds that were growing. It didn't grow en masse, like en masse. Like we used to have this cobbler's peg thing, and man, it was just, you, you couldn't walk five uh, metres anywhere without getting all of the seed all over your clothes everywhere. You just couldn't, right? And that went on for a couple of years, and then they've all died off, and they haven't come back. Because whatever they did, what the job was that they did, is done now. Now we're waiting for the next recovery, whatever that is, you see. Yep. So what we need to understand is that these steps are required to reverse this recovery. Now, of course, it's not an instant process. So, you know, you're not going to be able to go out there one year and plant a whole heap of plants and the next year you've got a lovely, you know, plants growing and everything's going to be good. It's not going to be like that. You see, we're instant, we're into instant gratification and that's what we want to have happen. And that's why we bring in all these in minerals from other elsewhere and all this stuff from other places and, and all these things from all over the place and all this stuff that's been taken out of other places to give to us. Not the waste of other places, but the stuff that's been taken out of other places to give to us. And the problem is that all that does is create an unsustainable environment in our place. So you walk away and you do something else, all that will die, which of course it does. Right? But it doesn't if you created a sustainable environment. You walk away and it just keeps going. <coughs> keeps growing, everything keeps growing, keeps producing food. You don't have to be there anymore. Can you see the difference? It's like, yeah. Okay, so once we've got the recovery organisms, the nitrogen fixing and other organisms that are now edible for animals, now animals can come in, they're higher intelligent, they can add to the system. So there's more higher creatures that come in that add to the intelligence of the system. Now that we've got that going, now the next phase is obviously the human comes in and he's able to sustain his life because now there's plants growing that can sustain him. And they'll all be growing naturally without him having to do any work. Uh, without having to do anything, because you've already done it. <laughs> All the preparation for it has already occurred. Does that make sense up to now? Right. Do you guys want to have a break for five minutes to go to the toilet? Yep. Who wants to go to the toilet? Yep. Let's have a break, because there's a natural break here, and then we'll work on what some practical, some practical things that we've done here to encourage this process. Does that make sense?